How's it going out there in internet land? This is my 21st live stream on TikTok. Uh, if you're watching the replay on YouTube, welcome to all those viewers who are actually investing their now space in watching this. Welcome. <clears throat> this is the second stream I've done on the God and Grammar series, which the first one was zero, and now this one is zero one. People ask me, why do you start counting at zero? Why don't you just start with one, two, three, four, blah, blah, blah. Well, the reason is, is have you ever seen a ruler? Does a ruler start at one or does it start at zero? Do we start at ground zero and work up or, or do we skip all that? That's the reason. So as you can see on your screen here, <laughs> I put into Google, picture of God. And this is what you see. Google is obviously, the algorithm is influenced by the Western ideology of Christianity. I always thought it was interesting, the, uh, the depictions of God as being bald. It's interesting. This is a pretty funny one with the, uh, you see, I'm not going to talk about it, but... <laughs> <sighs> Lots of interesting results here. I wonder if we replace that with Allah. That's what they think Allah looks like? Oh, we got the Saturn black box here. Yeah, Arabic. Writing. Pillars of Islam. Well, instead of the picture like of a man, a depiction of of a man, we mostly have pictures of writing and symbols and hieroglyphs. And we have pictures of Allah. What if we put in a picture of Yahweh? What do we get? We still get the, the old white-haired guy. But then we get some Clay tablature. And we get some Hebrew symbols, hieroglyphs. All right, that's enough of that. Let's head on over to Webster's 1828 and see what they have to say about faith. Because in this live stream, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give you a basis for my position on the way I look at this stuff and the way I look at some of these terms here. So in Webster's 1828, we have faith being described as... Latin fides, fido, which I guess would go into fidelity, to trust, to persuade, to draw towards anything, to conciliate, to believe, to obey. In the Greek lexicon of Heteric, it is said 
The primitive signification of the verb is to bind and draw or lead. Hold on. It says noun. Even though, yes, I know noun is in italics. But we're, we're communicating an adverb, verb, adjective, pronoun right now. So keep that with the balance of the honor and the grace. They're saying the verb. Faith is a verb. There is only one verb. And that is the verb is. And the plural form of that verb is, which is are. I digress. If faith is to be a verb, then it would be being modified by an adverb. Such as, if you say my faith, that's adverb verb. Is to bind and draw or lead as signifies a rope or cable, but this remark is a little incorrect. A little incorrect. How can something be a little incorrect? It's either correct or it isn't. The sense of the verb from which that of a rope and binding is derived is to strain, to draw, thus to bind or to make fast. A rope or cable, that which makes fast. Hebrew. So number one in the meanings is belief, the assent of the mind to the truth of what is declared by another. Resting on his authority and veracity without other evidence, the judgment that which another states or testifies is the truth. I have a strong faith or no faith in the testimony of a witness or in what a historian narrates. What a historian narrates? That should be Anne. Noah Webster, shame on you. Second meaning, the assent of the mind to the truth of a proposition advanced by another belief or probable evidence of any kind. Just throwing this out there for those of you individuals, more for the YouTube audience, because I know that the majority of the TikTok audience is, they're not familiar with correct sentence structure. But just check out the cadence of this part of this sentence. Of the mind to the truth of a proposition. Of the mind to the truth of a proposition. You can hear faint echoes of correct sentence structure in writings from the 1800s. Now the significance of that, I don't know. I can't really place a value on the significance, only that it's very curious that you will see that. But as time goes by and we get closer to the modern day, that totally disappears. In theology, the ascent of the mind or understanding to the truth of what God has revealed. Okay, so that's going totally into the religious connotations. So you can see some of the sayings here. <clears throat> Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For we walk by faith and not by sight. In other words, when you're thinking about it in these religious contexts, faith means you don't need evidence. You don't need proof. You just believe something. It's like these people, you know, I've had conversations with individuals who say that they believe in God. And I say, well, do you have proof of God? And they'll say, well, no, actually, I don't believe in God. I know there's a God. I just know it. Well, if you know it, if you have knowledge of something, then it stands to reason you would be able to certify that to someone else. You would be able to prove it. If I say, I just know this cup exists, I can prove it to you. Especially if you're standing right here, I can prove it to you. That it exists. I can hand it to you. You can look at it. You can mull it over. Ponder it. Same thing with any number of facts that you can certify. And when people run into that, then they just shut down. Because then they are forced to realize, yes, they are participating with a presumption and an assumption. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is because of the topic of this TikTok channel and of my YouTube channel, and that is Correct Sentence Structure Communication Parse Syntax Grammar, where we are looking at facts that can be certified. Do you see the importance of this? 
If you're going to be successful in using this grammar, you have to be able to certify your facts. And if you're basing your entire existence upon an assumption of a religious belief, then it's going to be a very, very challenging road for you. That That's the uh, kindest way I can put it. So here we see the etymology of the word faith. Faithfulness, mid-13th century, faithfulness to a trust or promise, loyalty to a person, honesty, truthfulness. From Anglo-French and Old French, fid, faith, belief, trust, confidence, pledge. From Latin, fides, trust, faith, confidence, reliance, credence, belief. Fidere, to trust. From Proto-Indo-European root, bh, E-I-D-H, to trust, confide, persuade. For sense evolution, compare belief. Belief, as you can see here, belief, that's two particles, B-E. If you look up B-E by itself with a hyphen after it, which is the way you would look it up for the particle B-E, it, it's a particle of negation. It means no, as in behead, no head. Belief, no leaf. And if you look up I, if you look up L I E F or L I V E, it means love. So belief literally means no love. That's why you'll hear me say I do not participate with beliefs. So 14th century assent of the mind to the truth of a statement for which there is incomplete evidence. And that sums it up right there, folks. The modern sense, the religious sense of the word faith, meaning your mind, you allow your mind to agree for, with something that has little to no evidence. But you agree it's a fact. And that's why I say that religion, the Bible, monotheism, is one of the most successful mind control psyops mechanisms ever perpetrated upon mankind because it gets mankind to believe in something with no proof. And if you can get someone to believe in something wholeheartedly to the point where they will actually go to war for that assumption presumption, you can get them to do anything. You can get them to believe that Everything they do in this existence, on this earth, during this lifetime, that they need to suffer so that in some imaginary lifetime after they pass away and die, that they'll be able to be in heaven and be happy for the rest of their lives. That's an assumption. Because nobody knows what happens after you die. Nobody. There are no eyewitness accounts that can be proven that someone has actually gone to another location after dying and then came back here to tell the tale. Now, you, you can talk about near-death experience all you want to, but then if you get into the psych, uh, scientific, peer-reviewed sector of that conversation, you realize all the chemicals that are released, released by your consciousness when things like that are happening in your body vessel. All sorts of chemicals or imbalances are created, and all sorts of hallucinations can happen, just like with hallucinogenic drugs. So if that's happening, then an individual isn't, as they would say, dead dead. There's still some life force happening there. Because there, if there is no life force, then there is no life force. There is no consciousness. That particular vessel is gone. That body-mind vessel is gone. And doesn't come back. At least not to my knowledge. In a scientific peer-reviewed paper. Which is pretty much all we have to go on. And again, you know, it's hard to trust any of these things. So the best thing to do, at least I've found the best thing to do, 
is to look at as many of them as you can, stay objective, cross-reference, and pick the most probable or logical conclusion and go with that. But even then, it's not really a fact. It's just a probability. I go into great depth on my YouTube channel as to what a fact is. And I do recommend anyone out there who's interested in learning quantum grammar to compile a checklist for a fact. Like if you're going to say that something is a fact, it has to tick all of those boxes. If it doesn't, then it's not a fact. That's a good start anyways. So this is the modern sense of the word faith. Now I do participate with the word faith as a fact. And I'm going to show you that. So you see here, this is my correct sentence structure, communication, parsley, syntax, grammar, closure, i.e. finite mean on the word faith. For the faith of this finite mean is with the claim of this certainty, with the certification by this claim. And then backwards, that would be for this claim of the certification is with the certainty of the claim, with the finite mean by the faith. And what I'm telling you is, it's a claim of certainty. I am certain of it. I am certain of something. And by certainty, I mean I can prove it. I can prove it to you. As an outside contract party, I can prove it to you. With certification. I can provide evidence. For myself, if I'm just going to prove it to myself as a fact, if I'm going to have faith as a fact, I can certify it by my senses. Can I see it? Can I hear it? Can I touch it? Can I smell it? So on and so forth. That's certification. But if I'm going to certify it to you, then you also have to be able to certify it in that same method. Otherwise, I'm asking you to assume and presume, which I would not do. So that is the difference between my closure on the word faith and what the word faith, in the modern sense, what it, what it means in a religious sense. My finite meaning of the word faith, my closure on it, is closer to what it's historically what the original meaning of the word would be. <clears throat> so let's go into a couple more correct sentence structure terms. Certainty. What do I mean by certainty? For the certainty of this finite mean is with the claim of this sift, with the measure of the purity, with the certification by this claim. Backwards, that would be for this claim of the certification is with the purity of the measure, with the sift of the claim, with this finite mean by the certainty. So sifting, we're going through the measurement of the purity of a thing. So therefore, there is no modification. There is no uncertainty. It's pure. <clears throat> it has to be measured 100% pure and wholesome. That's certainty. That's what I mean by certainty. If you're going to contract with me using correct sentence structure and you are a live life claimant, this is the term certainty. This is the closure on that term that you would have to possess. Just like all the facts of the terms of the contracts that we would participate with if you and I were to contract. Next up we have spirit. Spirit of this finite mean is with the claim of this performance contract with the breath of the life with the life force by this claim. And then backwards it's for this claim of the life force is with the life of the breath with this performance contract of the claim with the finite mean by the spirit. So what I mean by spirit, when I'm talking about spirit, it's a performance contract with the breath of the life. In other words, the breath of the life is the spirit. In order for something to have spirit, it would be breathing. <laughs> it's the breath of the life. And I'm going to get into that deeper uh, with some of the finite means coming up.
breath of this finite me is with this claim of this vibration, with the share and participation of the air and spirit and sacred life force, with the contract parties of the contract and covenant field with certification by a form and vessel and contract party, period. Backwards, that would be for a form and vessel and contract party of the certification is with the contract and covenant field of the contract parties with the air and spirit and sacred life force of the share and participation with this vibration of this claim with the finite mean by the breath. So let's get a little bit more complex here, but it's, it's a vibration claim. That is what breath is. We're sharing with the spirit and the air and the sacred life force. Now, some people are going to say, well, wait a minute. Isn't there a particle of negation in sacred, the ED at the end? Folks, if you're asking that question, then that means you have not looked that word up. You have not put the work in. So go ahead and look that word up you will find that ED is not credentialed as a separate particle of negation in that word. Sacred is to be taken in its entirety. There is no suffix. That is why it can be used. So again, everything is contract, so it's also a contract and a covenant field. So we're when we're talking about breath in this context, we're talking about the contract and covenant field. Everyone who's within that range of the contract. If you're outside that range of breath, then you're probably not living. Get it? Next, we have the closure on the word life. For the life of this finite mean is with this claim of this source and nativity, with this knowledge of this cogitative conveyance, will, and of this volition, with the certification claimed by this claimant. And backwards, that would be for this claimant of the certification claim is with this volition, will, and with this cogitative conveyance of this knowledge, with this source and nativity of this claim, with this finite mean by this life. So it's a claim of sorts and nativity with knowledge of the cogitative conveyance. And what that simply means is cogitative means thinking. So you're conveying your thoughts, your will, your volition, and you're certifying it. That is what life is. And again, this is all comes down to having closure on what it is you're talking about. If you feel, if you're listening to this right now, if you're watching this right now, and you feel like it's going right over your head, my best guess is that you are curious about correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar, but you have not really studied it. You have not really gotten down to the nuts and bolts of it. If you do choose to study it, this type of thing will become more and more clear to you and you will be so sure of it, so confident of it, the same way you're confident that a cup can hold coffee or liquid or you're sure that the sun's going to come up tomorrow. It just takes study. And now space. But the reason I've given you closure on these terms is to show you my position with regards to facts as opposed to the assumption, presumption of the whole God concept and religious concept because I know there are a lot of you out there who are heavily emotionally invested in that. Presumption, assumption. And I am also aware that many people that are invested in that assumption, presumption, might become angry 
about this type of thing might get offended by it. Which, I mean, you can totally shut this off and not listen to it anymore and continue on with your particular belief system. This is for the people that actually want to question everything. Who honestly have an open mind and are willing to consider other methods of cogitation, other methods of cognition, other than the ones they were most likely programmed with since birth. Next finite mean is form. For the form of this finite mean is with this claim of this cognition, with these parts of this whole, with this diction location or place of these mediations with these conveyances by the contract vessel. I'm always trying to simplify and be consistent with my correct sentence structure. So I'm going to add a colon in here after the conjunction or so that represents with this. So I'm going to read this again. For the form of the, this finite mean is with this claim of this cognition, with these parts of this whole, with this diction location, or with this place of these mediations, with these conveyances by the contract vessel. And then backwards, for the contract vessel of these conveyances is with these mediations of this diction location or of this place with this whole of these parts with this cognition of this claim with this finite mean by the form. So what it is, is it a claim of? It's a claim of cognition, understanding with the parts of the whole. We're talking about judge mechanics now, rule one, rule equal. Got to consider the whole with the diction location or place of the mediations, negotiations. So we're contracting. We're dictating things, not dictating as in commanding or anything. We're sharing our terms and conditions with these conveyances by the contract vessel. That is what a form is. It's a claim of cognition with the parts of the whole, with the communication location, where mediation or IE negotiations are taking place. You wouldn't use the word negotiations because we have that negative particle right there, the any. So we're not going to use that in a correct sentence structure fact. And then finally we have sacred life force, which if you remember uh, back here in the in the finite meaning of spirit, I use life force. So let's take a look at the sacred life force. Sacred life for the sacred life force of this finite mean is with this claim of the source, with the flow of the life force, with the life form by this claim, and then backwards, for this claim of a life form is with the life force of the flow, with the source of this claim, with this finite mean by the sacred life force. So what is it a claim of? It's a claim of source. The sacred life force is a claim of source. What's possessing the source? The flow. What's the flow concerned with? The life force. Remember, going back to breath and spirit. What's possessing the life force? A life form. Form. Remember form? And what's the authority of that form? This claim of the sacred life force. So I've just explained to you, using correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar, closure, my position on some of these words. So as you can see, I use some of them. I do participate with them as facts. And I can certify the ones that I've shared with you. I'm not asking you to just trust in what I'm saying. I'm not asking you to have faith in the religious belief system sense of the word. What I'm saying is to have faith 
in the correct sentence structure sense of the word, meaning be certain about it and be able to certify it. Be certain and be able to certify it. Because if you can't do that, then what you're talking about is not a fact. It's a presumption and it's an assumption. It's an opinion. And what's an opinion? It's a no pinning contract. And you know what they say about opinions. Everybody has one, right? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pull up a video that I saw on YouTube. I haven't watched it yet. It's supposedly four minute proof of God. So I'd be interested to see that. So let me see if I can pull that up real quick for you. The key principles of Judaism, creation, revelation, and redemption, provide us with three pathways in which to encounter God. So let's take first creation. One of the greatest scientists of our time, Lord Martin Rees, former astronomer royal, president of the Royal Society, master of Trinity College, Cambridge, one of the greatest scientists in the world, in his book Just Six Numbers, points out that the entire existence of the universe depends on six mathematical constants, which have to be so precise that the probability of any combustible source of energy coalescing around those six constant constants is almost infinitesimably small. So the universe is finely tuned for the emergence of life. It could not have happened by mere chance. Equally, the emergence of life itself from inanimate matter is both inherently mysterious and goes against one of the fundamental principles of entropy, which is that the world is gradually, any system gradually loses energy and order. Now, biology works in the exactly opposite way, from very simple uh, organisms to ever-increasing uh, organisms of self-organizing complexity. So if that didn't have an intelligent creator, we would have no way of understanding it at all. So if you look at creation, you realize why it was that Francis Collins, who headed the Human Genome Decoding Project, began it as an atheist and ended it as a religious believer. So if you look at creation, the simplest explanation, and I don't know of any other, for its fine tuning for the emergence of life, is an intelligent creator. And you don't need to invoke doubtful concepts like intelligent design. There's just no other way of explaining how it happened to be like that. So I'm going to pause right there and comment on what this gentleman is saying. Logically thinking about what he's saying, to a point, it definitely makes sense because I'm on board with that theory that when I look around, everything that I see in this room has been created by something else. Something has created the things around me. This shirt that I'm wearing, these headphones, were created by something or someone piloting that something, like a machine, you know, a sewing machine, whatever it is. So it stands to reason, like if you're following logic, a to B to C to D, so on and so forth, that this vessel would have been created by something. Because it just makes sense. But that's where I draw the line, you see, between what I think and what this guy thinks. This guy makes the leap of assumption that because there is a creator, an intelligent, meaning cogitative creator, a creator that is thinking, right? Because you have to think to create, but 
that's not entirely true either. Because if you think about, if you consider how babies come into this domain, especially, and this is a taboo subject, but let's just say young folks out there who are experimenting with sex aren't really thinking about having babies, are they? They're not thinking about creating life when they're having sex. So you're not really thinking about it. It just happens. So that's not entirely true what he's saying there, that it must be an intelligent creator. Because you can have a stupid creator too. <laughs> Point I'm making is he makes a leap of assumption that not only is it a creator, but it has to be some omnipotent, all-powerful creator. A godlike creator. Why? Why? Does it have to be that? that? That's where I disagree. I agree with the theory or the probability that things are, as a whole have a creator. What I don't agree with is just assuming that it's some all-powerful, unfathomable, imaginary giant of a being. That's the discrepancy. Secondly, in terms of revelation, the Torah. Look at Judaism. Jews are a tiny people, 14 million perhaps in the world today. And yet so powerful were the ideas of Torah that they inspired. I would be remiss if I didn't mention this. He just said the Jews are such a small segment of society of the population, yet so powerful. <clears throat> if you read a book, look it up on the internet called When Victims Rule. When Victims Rule. It's been around for, for a couple decades now. And it's a real eye-opener. It's an alternative history. Basically, um, history that you will not read in the mainstream of Jews. In that Jews, people who consider themselves to be Jews, historically have been, in each society or community, the smallest segment of that society or community, yet one of the most powerful segments of said society. Even though they're the smallest, they're one of the most powerful. Why? Because they're the wealthiest, usually, of that community. So if you have a small segment of Jews in a community, they usually exert the most control because they have the most wealth. Because that's the golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rules. That in and of itself is an interesting thing. Doesn't make them good. Doesn't make them bad. These are historically certifiable concepts. He just said it himself. Jews are historically the smallest, you know, even now, segment of a community or society. Yet the most powerful. Why? Well, I just told you why I think it is. And if you look up that book, When Victims Rule, uh, you'll get a, a different angle on it. But let's continue to listen to what this gentleman is saying. Inspired two other great religions, each of which took a part of Judaism, not the whole of it, but see themselves as worshipping the God of Abraham. And that comprises 2.4 billion Christians and 1.6 billion Muslims far more than half the people alive today. Now, how was it that a man, Abraham, who lived almost 4,000 years ago, who commanded no armies, ruled no empire, performed no miracles, uttered no world-changing prophecies, his lessons are so pure and true and eternally valid that they have persuaded more than half the world's population there is not a single human being who has ever lived who had a greater influence. And if Again, this argument that this gentleman is presenting is built upon, with my perception, a false premise. Because historically, how can you even certify that someone named Abraham actually existed? If your proof is, well, 
You know, like this guy says, look at all of these writings, the Torah, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's proof enough. No, it is not proof enough. Because as I said in the first edition of God and Grammar, history is written by the winners. And historically, thousands of years ago, the surviving records, the surviving manuscripts that were written, were also written by priests or monks. The people at the top of the pyramids of power who controlled the people. These people dictated what the, the plebs, the goy, whatever you want to call them, the peasants were doing. And they created those religious writings. Well, if they didn't create them, they disseminated them. They controlled them. History is written by the winners, number one. Number two, the majority, the vast majority, the overwhelming majority of surviving historical documents were written by monks, priests, so on and so forth, the most intelligent, educated people of a community had the most influence. So doesn't it stand to reason that these writings would have been written to serve whatever bias or purpose that these ruling class, these ruling classes had in mind? It, it's not that far. I mean, it's logically, it makes sense. There is really very little other explanation that I can come to other than history is written by the winners. And who are the winners? The ones in control. The most recent and easily accessible example of this would be even today, in today's elementary school textbooks, the North American account in elementary school textbooks of Thanksgiving. If that is not proof through history, empirically, of the truth of revelation, I don't know what is. As for redemption, the great open societies of the West were built in the 17th century by people deeply immersed in the Hebrew Bible, whether they be uh, uh, John Milton and John Locke in England, or the great Calvinists in Scotland or in Holland, or the Puritans who made their way in the 1620s and 30s to America. These were all people inspired by Torah to build free societies. With the okay, I don't really get how that's proof that God exists. I don't really see it. He's offering all this theoretical nonsense. And by nonsense, I, okay, that's a little harsh. <clears throat> He's offering theories to try and prove God as a fact. And that's not how facts work. They have to be certified. And... Uh, He's definitely not doing that. So let, let's look at this other one here. I see one that says, proofs in three minutes. Let's check that one out. It's the question of our skeptical age, and every age really. Does God exist? Here are three lines of argument that suggest the answer <clears throat> is yes. Three lines of argument that suggest the answer is yes. Argument number one. Arguments exist where opinions exist. And number two, suggestion. It's suggesting the answer is yes. Not saying the answer is yes. It's suggesting. So, again, this is framing this entire video in the domain of opinion. The first cause argument goes like this. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe had a cause. And if the universe had a cause, then an uncaused creator of the universe must have caused it. That first cause of the universe is... Whatever begins to exist has a cause. Okay? The universe began to exist. 
Hmm. See, this, this is where they start to lose me because, like, when I think of the now space, as I like to call it, the continuum. The continuum continues. I don't know if the continuum began. I don't know if the continuum ends. I know that for me, for me, as a claimant, as a live life claimant, as a life form, as a life force, as we talked about earlier in this live stream, I know that I began and I know that I'm going to end. But as far as the continuum, I, I don't know if it begins or ends. I know that it begins and ends for me, but I can't make a claim for it. That's a trespass. So again, this is sort of a faulty premise. As I said, it's an argument, so that means there's opinions here. This is all fiction thinking. So keep that in mind. This is all fiction thinking, because once you put it through the lens of correct sentence structure, it falls apart completely. Because one may only make a claim for oneself. Therefore, the universe had a cause. Okay, I can stick with that. And if the universe had a cause, then an uncaused creator of the universe must have caused it. Now, see, they're pulling that out of left field. How's that even possible? It says, whatever begins to exist has a cause. So, why, how does the universe beginning to exist prove that the creator of said universe was not caused? Because if a creator exists, then by this logic, the creator would have to have a creator. Would have to have a cause. Universe has a cause. The cause of that universe is the creator. The creator has a cause. The cause of that creator is another creator, so on and so forth. The continuum. That makes sense to me. I don't understand why people have a problem grasping that following that logic because suddenly when it comes to topics like God they suddenly want to start making exceptions they want to move the goalposts again a logical fallacy they want to move the goalposts to accommodate their particular belief system what we call God <clears throat> of course some say that the first cause was particles that came together for a big bang and that certainly may have happened but what's the more likely first cause of everything? Space dust particles that have always existed, or a supernatural being who has always existed, and then created that space dust? <laughs> Folks, the reason I'm laughing is because that's another logical fallacy, the either-or fa fallacy, I think it's called, where they only give you two choices when there's obviously more possibilities that exist. But... Of course, they're going to only give you the, uh, the criteria that fit their particular bias. Second, the fine-tuning argument goes like this. There are laws in nature that no one disputes, constants like the speed of light, the rate of gravity, the rate that the universe expands, and so on. Hold on a minute. And it's also undisputed by physicists that the universe expands, and so on that the universe the rate of gravity constants like the speed of light the speed of light is that a constant i don't know too much about the speed of light but is that a constant is that something that can actually be proven with first-hand knowledge the rate of gravity rate of gravity is that also something that can be proven by first-hand knowledge or gravity in and of itself. I know that I can do this. <clears throat> I can do this. What else can I drop here? <laughs> so I, I know I can do those things. So I guess that can be proven with first-hand knowledge. The rate that the universe expands. And... Okay, the rate that the universe expands. Now that is most certainly an assumption presumption. Because what is universe? If we're going to look at it through a grammatical sense, universe is no contract. It's a vowel in front of a consonant at the beginning of a word. 
So I prefer to use the word cosmos in the sense of that concept of when you look up at the sky at night and you see twinkling lights up there. Or if you're in an airplane 40,000 feet at nighttime above the, the clouds and stuff. And the horizon is eye level. The horizon, not the curve horizon, the horizon. And you can see the cosmos, the twinkling little lights and things like that. I would call that the cosmos if I had to put a name to it. But as for what exactly that is, I don't know. I've never been there. I only know what other people have said. I personally don't know anyone who's ever been there physically. So that's beyond the scope of correct sentence structure as far as I'm concerned, in practicality. So on. And it's also undisputed by physicists that if any of these parameters were the slightest bit larger or smaller, then life could have never occurred in our universe. If any of these parameters were the slightest bit larger or smaller, then life could never have occurred. That's definitely an assumption. For example, if the gravitational constant, which is the strength of gravity, varied by as little as 1 in 10 to the 60th power, that's 1 followed by 60 zeros, then matter would be too heavy or too light to support life, and none of us would exist. If the cosmological constant, which is the expansion rate of the universe, were different by even 1 part in 10 to the 120th power, the universe would have expanded too rapidly or too slowly to support life. And if the mass and energy of the early universe were not evenly distributed to the precision of 10 to the 10th to the 123rd power, that's 10 to the power of 1 followed by 123 zeros, the universe would be hostile to life of any kind. Big numbers aside, the point is this. The possibility of all these things happening by chance is as close to zero as a number can get. So if not by chance, how did such fine tuning of the universe occur to support life? possibility of all these things happening by chance is as close to zero as a number can get. But it's not zero, is it? It's close to zero, but it's not zero. So again, no matter how small, we can safely say that this is based upon presumption, assumption, for sure. I personally don't participate with the concepts of chance or coincidence. I think that everything happens for a reason, for sure. But again, the thing that separates me from individuals such as these people, I don't automatically throw that assumption, make the leap to, well, it must be an all-powerful God that did all this. An all-powerful, all-knowing God. Because the same, I mean, if you're going to follow that logic through, you know, that this God is so intelligent, so hyper smart, that it can do all these mathematical formulations and keep life existing and down to the minuscule little power to the whatever, is that hyper intelligent? Yet this God also creates the LGBT elemental P Skittles people or Joe Biden or I mean you know you, you just throw all kinds of stuff on the table it's all assumption presumption it's a lot of uh, interesting things to talk about of course but to bring it back to the grammar you have to be able to prove your facts and all of this so far is just basically assumption presumption the most plausible explanation is that these precise conditions occurred by design by an all-powerful being that we call God. Third argument, if you're not convinced by philosophy or physics, consider the evidence from those who claim to have experienced God, people who were clinically dead and then brought back to life. An enormous body of literature now documents thousands of such near-death experiences with an impressive amount of consistency across the reports. In a sentence, the evidence suggests that consciousness survives death, with many people describing quite blissful after-death experiences Okay, let's just stop it right there and talk about what they just said. Testimonies from people who were clinically dead and brought back to life. So they weren't dead dead. They were clinically dead. 
The evidence suggests that consciousness survives death. I have no beef with that. I really don't. I personally, my perception, my theory is that that is very probable. That consciousness, you know, the, the physical body vessel may cease being imbued with life. But whatever the consciousness is continues on, whether that's a part of a whole or whether it's something else, I can't really say. But again, the thing that separates me from people like this is that I don't make that leap of logic. I don't make that leap of assumption that it's an all-powerful God that does this. Because if you think about it, think about your body, your biosphere. Think about the cells in your body. All of the millions and billions of cells in your body. Are you aware of them? Do you know they exist other than you can go to a laboratory, uh, take a blood sample, and you can see the cells in your blood? Do you have a name for each one of those cells? Do you know each cell's particular function? Do you know what they're doing right now? Are they on lunch break? Are they going to the, the theater? Are they having a conversation? Are they, are they going on strike? I mean, do you know what your cells are doing at any given moment? Probably not. You're probably not even conscious of the cells. You probably just assume they exist. So... Using that train of logic, what if this concept of God is like the same thing? What if God is a creator and we are like these little cells and this God sort of knows we're there but has no idea what we're doing <laughs> and has no idea who or what we are? It's just a good a possibility has just as much a, a possibility as what this guy's saying. There's all sorts of things, you, all sorts of assumption and presumption you can go into when you're in the land of opinion. And others, truly horrifying experiences. The most compelling testimonies are those where people returned with information they should not be able to know. Verifiable facts about circumstances that occurred while they had flatlined. The argument, then, is that these reports provide mounting data from around the world that there is indeed life after death, and the being who created and directs that afterlife is what we call God. Now, And there you have it. Your leap of assumption. That's a very simplified version of these arguments, of course. So dig deeper for yourself into the existence of God. All based on assumption presumption, there has been nothing presented here at all that has moved any of the arguments toward the conclusion that such a thing actually exists in the context that they provide it. Well, just as a little side note, I hope you found this entertaining. And uh, I don't know how many more of these I'm going to do because I thought, I thought for sure this would be a surefire um, viewer magnet. But I'm actually getting the impression that it's probably the opposite because this forces people, not forces people, but it's sort of, brings people into a very uncomfortable scenario, perhaps, in their own lives, where they begin to question their core beliefs that they've believed their whole lives, and it's uncomfortable to, and it's unsettling to have to question things that you thought were for sure concrete facts, and then you realize, whoa, that is not so. Maybe I've been participating with assumption, presumption all this time. And it sort of rocks your world. It sort of turns your world upside down. It really does. And I think that's what's happening. 
because my views have actually dropped since I've been bringing this stuff to the light. Now, it could, like, my goal on here on TikTok is to bring people to correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar. And there is a, a, a balance there. There is a balance there. Because I realize probably the majority of TikTok users do participate in some sort of Abrahamic religion, whether that's Judaism, Islam, or Christianity. And if they're made to put, you know, if they're put, in, if I put them in an uncomfortable situation where they have to question those type of beliefs, then they're just going to shut it down. You know, they're just not going to participate with it at all. That's called cognitive dissonance. I've gotten into conversations with very good friends about this stuff, and I've found that they, you know, if someone who is a what they would call a true believer in a religious system, in a spiritual belief system of monotheism, they are very emotionally connected to that system. And if I criticize that system, they take it as a personal insult. They think that I'm attacking them when I'm not. I'm not attacking them as a person. I'm criticizing the religious system that they participate with. But they don't take it that way. They think that I'm attacking them. That's It's sort of like um, you take a symbol, like a flag, all right? You take, uh, say you have the stars and stripes. Somebody takes the stars and stripes and they start burning that flag. And you have someone sitting beside him who is so intrinsically connected to that symbol that they take it as if it's a personal insult. And so they attack the person burning the flag. They physically assault them because they've burned the flag. Because they're emotionally attached to that flag. So you got to be aware of these types of connections and, you know, use consideration and that's definitely something I'm going to take into consideration. This actually might be the last God and Grammar live stream now that I'm thinking about it. If you have any suggestions, go ahead and uh, leave them in the comments or you can contact me at jasonmatthewg17 at gmail.com and uh, offer your thoughts as well if you want to do that in a confidential and you don't want anyone else to, uh, to hear what you're saying. You just want to share it with me. Go ahead and send me that email. Or, of course, if you want to learn this grammar. So, for those of you out there who did watch this, thank you very much for watching. I hope that you uh, gained something from it. And uh, hopefully see you in the next one. If you'd like to learn correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar, contact me at the email address listed at the bottom of your screen. I will set up a 10 to 15 minute video consultation between you and me. You can ask me whatever you like and I'll do the same and we'll see if this is something that uh, you're prepared to commit to. Thank you again and I'll see you in the next one.